Recording in progress. Okay, folks, so teacher, you know the one thing that you can't afford not to have is your voice. And today I'm dangerously close to losing my voice, so if I, if, if I do start to falter, I might have to go back and drink some tea or something, but uh, I think I can keep going, so. So you went to the baseball game? No, it's actually a cold that worked its way through the system. So the good news is it's not cold, but the bad news is my granddaughter, whose birthday it was a week ago, decided that she was going to share. <laughs> and she was very sharing. You know, so. now, I did go to the baseball game, but I don't scream at baseball games because I know I need my voice the next day. So, but but, but what the, I wanted to start this class by finishing up the very last piece of Packet 2. But rather than go to Packet 2, I was going to make it the start of the class test. So we've talked about private to private transactions, right? Painful, painful because you've got to deal with lack of diversification and liquidity. Private to public, you're celebrating. It's very much like a public company. Private to IPO, a few twists, but you're valued like a public company, but then you have to worry about you know, what you do with the offering proceeds, those options that are hangover. I want to finish by looking at a private to public transaction that's a little more involved. <coughs> So let's say you're the founder of a company, and you have big plans. So right now, you want to start the company. You're already thinking about going public. So that's how much potential you think your plan has. For the next couple of years, you expect to have enough capital to keep this company going. You're completely undiversified. You're going to be locked into the company. So let's say that the beta for the business you're in is one, and the correlation of the typical company. So let's say you're a software company. The unlevered beta is one your correlation, the correlation of a typical software company in the market is 0.25. You're completely undiversified. Let me pause right there. You're the founder, you're completely undiversified. You look at this company, you don't see a beta one, right? Because you're exposed to all the risk, you see a beta four. Essentially, you see four times as much risk because everything you own is tied up in the company. But the way you see this going is two years from now, you plan to go to a venture capitalist. The venture capitalist is not diversified either, but they're spread out across 30 software companies. What does that give them? It gives them some of the benefits of diversification because the software sector overall has a higher correlation than individual software companies. Why? Because you know, what you have is company-specific risk starts to average out there. So let's say the correlation with the market that you get for the software group as a whole, or the venture capital, what the venture capital is, is 0.5. Same company, same unlevered beta, but now the marginal investor is walking in and their beta that they will see will not be the four that the founder did or the one that the fully diversified investor, the beta they're going to see in this company is two, which effectively lowers the cost of equity for the company. 
So for the first two years, it's the founder's money. It's you know, a total beta for a high cost of equity. Then the VC comes in and provides capital. They're a little more diversified. That pushes the cost of equity down. And then you get to your five things, go as planned. What do you plan to do? You go, to, you go, you go public. Who's buying your shares? Investors. Are they diversified? You don't care. It's their choice. If they choose not to be diversified, it's their problem. But your investors are diversified. The beta they're going to see in this company is going to back to being one. Same company, different costs of equity as you go through time. You see how to value this company? Now you've got to use different costs of equity. The cost of equity that I've estimated here, 24% for the first two years, reflects the fact that it's your money tied up that it's 14% for the next three years because the venture capitalist is accepting a lower cost of equity. They're now the marginal investors. And then you go public, it's the invest diversified investor. Their beta is lower, the cost of equity. So here's how it, it, it plays out. Your terminal value will be computed based on the 9% cost of equity because that's when you go public. The 14% will be the discount rate when the VC is the marginal investor. 24% will be the discount rate when the founder is the investor. Discounting the cash flows just became a huge pain in the neck. Why? Because you can't use the present value function in Excel anymore. Your cost of equities are changing over time. So you notice that I do something that I always do in my valuation, which is to compute the, this accumulated cost of equity. What does it allow you to do? It allows you to reflect the fact that your discount rate is changing over time, and you take that accumulated cost of equity, that is what I'm going to use for my present value factor. Using that correct Accumulated cost of equity, the value of the firm that I get is 1.5 million, or 1.5 billion, depending on how much you want to scale it down. You're saying, couldn't I have just used the present value function? How different would my answer have been? If you, if you used a, 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 a cost of equity that basically did not, if you didn't use accumulated cost of equity, use the present value function, the value that you would get here would be higher by about $300 million because you're essentially mismatching the cash flows, the discount rates. If you use a 24% discount rate as your cost of equity forever, you're going to destroy the value. The value is going to be much lower. As you're using a 9% cost of equity is going to give you too high a value. Why, the reason you're getting in the middle is you have to live through those five years of no and partial diversification to get to that point of diversification. Now, what will happen if I can shrink that window? If I say I can go public in three years, then I'm going to have less of a diversification penalty to pay, right? What if the VCs who enter in in year three are more diversified than I thought they were? It's again going to reduce the diversification. No consequence, the discount you're applying. I mean, there was much talk about the gray market that was created in the last decade by public market investors entering the VC space the T row prices, the fidelities coming in and acquiring stakes of Uber and other young companies. What that effectively meant that every startup benefited from that trend because when you value a startup now, instead of assuming that the marginal investor in a year or two would be a VC who is not that diversified, you now have somebody who's the equivalent of a public market investor. You've actually removed many of the incentives to go public in the first place, right? Because one of the reasons companies went public in the old day in the old, is because that's the only way you could unlock that diversification effect. Now I think you can stay private, get diversified investors, effectively get almost the same value. <coughs> Excuse me. Same value that you'd have got as a public company which is one reason, if you look at companies going public now, they're older by almost a decade than companies that went public 30 years ago. Typically, companies used to go public four, five, six years into their lives. Now they wait till they're 13, 14, 15 years because you can afford to wait. The costs of waiting have become smaller. Now, there's a social cost though. By allowing private companies to be value like public companies without the public disclosure requirements of public companies or the corporate governance requirements of public companies. We are asking for some surprises. And that's, I think, the downside of this development we've seen in VC markets where public equity investors are. <coughs> Any questions? Yeah. So I'm going to start on real options, but you know, before I jump into, <coughs> excuse me, 
Before I jump into real options, I want to do a very quick review of basic option pricing. I know you understand the black shoals, the binomial, all that stuff, but I will assume you remember nothing. So I'm going to take you through about a 30 minute review of basic option pricing. Because to talk about real options without talking about the basics of option pricing is introducing a tool that requires some understanding before you use it. So let's start by looking at the basis for why real options have become such a hot topic in corporate finance and valuation. For as long as I know, people have always looked for a way to justify paying a premium. And optionality gives you an argument for doing it. In fact, this has become a word that people throw as a buzzword. You know, you do a net present value of a project and it's negative. You say, don't take the project, but the managing director says, but there's optionality there. You find a stock that is overvalued. You say, I don't want to buy the stock, but there's optionality there. Especially with platform companies, this became the vehicle that people used to saying, let's buy a big platform. It doesn't make any sense, but we get optionality. So today I want to give you some questions you can ask to decide when it makes sense to use the optionality argument and when it does. But here's what the optionality argument at its core looks at. It looks at the fact that when you do a traditional investment analysis or valuation, here's what you do. You take the information you have today, you estimate expected cash flows, you discount them back at a risk-adjusted discount rate based on what you know today. That's all I can ask you to do, right? And you come up with the value today. You're saying, what else can I do? What you're not factoring in is sometimes there can be options that you're missing here. Here's one of the first. When you do a traditional capital budgeting analysis, you get the present value of the cash flows, they're less than the initial investment, your net present value is negative. What's the conclusion you draw? Bad project, don't take the project. That's still true. But having the rights to this bad project, could it be worth something? Absolutely, because we can delay taking this project, it might be a time in the future when this project could become viable. It's called the option to delay. I'm going to use that as the entree to talk about why a non-viable technology might be valued. So let's say I come to you with this great AI technology, extraordinarily expensive right now, doesn't make sense to develop it. My guess is I'll have people buying that technology from me because if they can make the right changes, it could be an incredibly lucrative technology. It's your option to delay. The second option is an even more dangerous one. I come to you with a bad project. You saying? Why would I take a bad project? Because it gives you the rights to an even worse project in the future. This is going from bad to worse, right? It gives you a bad project with the rights to a worse project. But the second project, you get to pick whether to take it or not. I'm going to argue there will be cases where you will take a bad project because it gives you the right to expand or do something in a much bigger market that right now doesn't make sense. But if it did, it could be looked at. That's your option to expand. The third is once you make an investment, especially if it's a long-term investment, and it's a very expensive investment, one of your concerns is what if things go wrong? Having the option to be able to walk away from those investments if things are going wrong early in its life. So let's say it's a 50-year investment, but you're able to walk away in your three or four or five, even with a fraction of what you originally invested might be something that might be va of value to you because you're not stuck with this investment for the next 45 years. It's your option to abandon. And all of these options essentially play out in your final decision making. That's, what, that's at the core of the real options argument. So let me give you a very simple decision tree example of how optionality can change decisions. So here you have two branches, 50-50 chance, a 50% chance of making 100 million, a 50% chance of losing 120. What's your expected value? Minus 10, right? Don't take the project. I'm going to take this decision tree and break it up into two branches. So the initial branch, there's a 75% chance you'll make 20 million, and a 25% chance you will lose 20 million. If you lose 20 million, that first try, you stop. If you make 20 million, there's a two-thirds chance you will get an 80 million additional value and a one-third chance that you will lose 100 million. You're saying, what's this got to do with the previous example? If you look at the total losses, I have minus 120, and the total upside, plus 100, looks very similar in terms of upside and downside. If you take the cumulative probabilities, 
of success and failure, it looks like I have 50% chance of upside and a 50% chance of downside. But if you get a chance, work through the expected value of this decision tree and it magically turns positive. So what is it about the second decision tree that makes a bad project into a good project? What am I getting to do in that second decision tree? Just you stop early on. First is I get to observe. First I do a small, it's almost like a test, right? I observe the outcome of the test. Then what do I do? I modify my decision based on what I see. So I observe the, the outcome and then I say, look, if I get a bad outcome on that first test, I stop. And if I get a good outcome, I continue. At the core of the real options argument are two components. One is that you get to observe something out there that tells you whether your project is going to be successful. And then you adapt your behavior based on what you've observed. One of the things we're going to talk about today is why when you value a traditional natural resource company, you tend to undervalue it, is because of this optionality. And here's why. Let's suppose I, I ask you to value an oil company. What do you do? You project out the expected barrels of oil that are produced, the expected oil price, you get an expected revenues, expected cash flow, you discount it back at a risk-adjusted discount rate, you come up with a value today. That's all you can do, right? But think about it. Your expected production and your expected oil price, you had to do. Right now, you don't know what it is. But if you are an oil company, what do you get to observe at the end of year one? At the end of year two, you get to observe the oil price. And after you observe the oil price, you can change how much you produce based on the oil price. That's the optionality you're missing in a traditional discounted cash flow model, is you get to observe something and change your behavior based on that. And that's what drives that extra premium you're willing to pay. So as I said, it's a, it's a very dangerous door we've opened because we've, we've in a sense, taken a first principle. I've called my corporate finance class in the capital budgeting section. We talk about net present value. The net present value is negative. Don't take the project. In valuation so far, we said we valued a company. It's less than the price. Don't buy the stock. I'm going to open the door to violating that rule. And I want to make sure it doesn't get opened all the time because otherwise you're going to be overriding your net present value, overriding your valuation and doing things anyway. So there are three basic questions that you need to ask and answer before you decide to use the real options argument. First is, you first have to decide whether there's an option embedded in an action, in a decision. So we'll talk about what is it that makes for an option. Second. When does that option have significant economic value? Because if it doesn't, then we're talking about something that's abstract. If it's worth two cents, who cares? If it's worth two billion, obviously I care. We'll talk about what is it that drives the value of an option. And third, when, does that, when can I estimate that value using an option pricing model? So let's start with the first of those questions. What is it that makes an option an option? Anybody want to help me out here? What are the things that ingredients you look for to make an option an option? It's not an obligation. It's, it's not. It's not a, it's a right. It's not a requirement, right? You get the choice, so that's good. What else? It's a derivative asset, which means there has to be an underlying asset. So if you tell me there's an option, the first question I'm going to ask you is, what is the underlying asset? If you don't have an answer, then I'm not sure I trust you when you say there's an option. There's an underlying asset. I get the right to buy that asset at a fixed price in a call option, the right to sell that asset at a fixed price in a put, put option. But it's a right. It's not an obligation. I choose to exercise that right. And the way this, of course, pays out is in that picture that basically sets options apart from every other asset out there, which is the payoff diagram. I showed it to you early in the class, but might as well show it again. The essence of options is you get limited downside because it's, an, it's, it's, it's a right, not an obligation. You, you cannot be forced to exercise an option. So you, all you lose is what you paid for the option and potentially unlimited upside in a call option. Why? Because who knows what the price can go to. So that's the first feature of options, limited downside, unlimited upside. If you have a put option, it just flips the diagram around. You have limited downside still, I would say unlimited upside because your price can't go below zero, but there is a lot of upside. 
So the essence of options is this payoff diagram. One of the things you're going to see me do with every real option I introduce, I'm going to talk about patents as options, undeveloped oil reserves as options, is with each one I'm going to show you the payoff diagram that I have. I'm going to tell you what my underlying asset is and what that contingency is. The contingency is where you get that, you know, where, the, where you get the graph turning. That drives the optionality. So that's the first step, is to make sure that what you're looking at is in fact an option. Second step, does this option have significant economic value? I'm going to introduce a word into your lexicon that you should use if you're surrounded by people who keep, start, keep talking about optionality. The word is exclusivity. Without exclusivity, there is no option value. What I mean by that, I said that you get the right to buy something at a price, right? If only you have the right, you have an option. If everybody has that right, that's not an option. The option value very quickly dissipates. In a traditional call or a put option or a listed stock, that exclusivity comes in the contract itself. You can buy it at $50. But when we talk about real options, this becomes a very critical question to ask because in my view, a lot of people mistake opportunities for options. Yes? Ed. Does that have implications on the industry that we're looking at and invested the best options? It, it depends on the industry for a couple of reasons. One is, in some industries, first movers might have such an advantage that once you move here, it becomes impossible for somebody else to come in. So in those industries, you could argue, there is an optionality in being that first mover because even if you lose money getting there, once you're there, you're the ruler of everything you see. You've set the terms. So in many technology businesses where first movers have essentially become these big winners, there is that optionality argument. It could also be that in an industry there are government licenses and regulations and if you get to be the company that gets that approval, then other companies can't come up. But it all goes back to, hey, what can competitors do, but what, what do I have the exclusive right to do? So if you decide there is a value to the option, we know conclusively what drives the value of an option. I can say, it. I don't, we don't know what conclusively what drives the value of a stock. There are too many variables we don't know. But with options, we know conclusively. Why? Because options are leeches. They derive their value from something else. The value of an option is determined by six variables. And let me list out the six. Three relate to the underlying asset. The first is the value of the underlying asset. As the value of the underlying asset goes up and down, the values of all options tied to it will also go up and down. Remember what I said, you get the right to buy something at a fixed price? If that something goes up in value by 20%, the right to buy it became more valuable because you have a fixed price. So as the value of the underlying asset goes up, calls will become more valuable, puts will get less valuable. Second, the variance in that value becomes a driver of the value of your options. And this is where options exercise their difference from every other asset class. Every other type of uh, asset, no, but discounted cash flow, valuation or pricing, as risk went up, value went down. With options, as <coughs> risk goes up, value goes up. And it goes back very simply to that downside protection you've got. Risk becomes your ally. So the more uncertainty there is about the underlying asset, the more valuable all our options become on it. Third, any expected dividends that that asset pays will affect the value of your option. Why is that? I mean, think in terms of stock, yeah. Because the moment you get the dividend, whoever is holding the asset, the value goes down. The price of a stock goes down by roughly the dividend on the ex-dividend day. Why? Because cash leaves the company, the business pays less. That can be generalized in any kind of asset. When the asset pays a dividend, the value of the asset will go down. So when you're valuing an option on an asset and you expect dividends on the asset for the next three, four, five years, the more dividends you expect, the lower the value of the option will be because you can see that ex-dividend day behavior play out every three months for the next four or five years. So value of the asset matters, the variance in that value matters, the dividends in the asset matter. You turn to the option itself, there are two characteristics of the option that drive its value. First is the strike price, and you can see why. I said a call gives you the right to buy something at a fixed price. Would you like that right at a lower price or a higher price? The lower the price, the more valuable the option, right? 
So if I give you the right to buy something at $10, it's worth more than the right to buy the same thing at $20. In the case of a put option, the reverse is going to be true because you get the right to sell at that price. So the exercise price matters. And how much time you have to play the game also matters. The longer the time I let you have this right, the more valuable the right becomes. So we've got up to five variables. There's only one macro variable in here. It's a riskless rate. Why the riskless rate? Because in an option, you get the right to buy something at a fixed price in the future, right? A year from now, you've got to pay a million dollars. But you have a year before you pay the million dollars. If interest rates are 3%, the present value of a million is pretty close to still a million, right? 996,000. But if interest rates are 50%, that one million you've got to pay a year from now is worth a lot less. So when, when you have risk, riskless rates go up, the value of call options will tend to increase because that exercise price in today's terms becomes less onerous, less expensive. Put options, you receive that money a year, two years from now. The higher the risk-free rate becomes, the lower the value of what you're going to receive. So put options are affected negatively. That's it. Those are the six variables. So is there an option? Is there exclusivity? In which case the value is in. Which brings us to the final question, which is, can I value this option using an option pricing model? And option pricing models can be incredibly messy in terms of mathematics. <laughs> but let me give you a little bit of history. Prior to 1971, the way people valued options is they did probabilities and estimated what the option would be worth and the stock went to a certain number. Paul Samuelson had one of the first option pricing models in the 60s, incredibly complicated. So it looked like you were valuing a stock. Every single outcome taken an expected value. In 1971, Fisher Black and Marin Scholes kind of revolutionized option pricing by noting some things which I, I think at that point in time had not been clarified, which is, you can create something exactly like an option. You're saying, what do you mean? You take an option that has expected cash flows, right, with every outcome. You can create what's called a replicating portfolio. A portfolio composed of the underlying asset and either borrowing or lending that has exactly the same cash flows as the option. So you want to buy a call option, I can create a portfolio composed of the stock and borrowing that looks exactly like a call option. It's called a replicating portfolio. In fact, every option pricing model is a search for that replicating portfolio. Because once you find the replicating portfolio, the second leg of the argument kicks in. So you now have an option and a replicating portfolio. They have exactly the same cash flows. The second argument is arbitrage. What does that mean? The two have to be priced at exactly the same price because if they're not priced at the same price, you have arbitrage. Why? Because you buy the cheaper one, you sell the more expensive one, you claim the difference today, and because their cash flows offset each other, there's no risk of cash flows in the future. Every option pricing model is built on replication and arbitrage. But think of what you need to do replication. You need to be able to trade the underlying asset. You need to be able to borrow and lend at the risk-free rate. The borrow and lend at the risk-free rate, we can dance around and get close enough. But can you always trade the underlying asset? If I buy a call option in IBM, can I trade the underlying asset? Yeah, IBM is a traded stock. But if I said I'm going to think of patents as, a, as an option. What's the underlying asset? I have a patent on a drug. The underlying asset is the drug that will emerge from it and the cash flows that will come from developing the drug, right? That's not a tradable asset. One of the things we're going to very quickly run into with real options is you can take option pricing models, you can come up with a value for a real option, but you're gonna have a far less confidence in that number than you do with listed options because you cannot replicate the option and you cannot do arbitrage. So with, that, with, with those concerns, let's very quickly spend a little, very quickly spend some time on you know, how you create this replicating portfolio and how it plays out in option pricing models. I said, whatever option you have, I can create a portfolio of the underlying asset and a riskless asset that creates exactly the same cash flows as the option. With a call option, I'll borrow the money and buy delta shares. Of the, you're saying, what's delta? That's going to be something I'm going to very quickly go through. But that's what an option pricing model tries to try. How many shares 
of the underlying stock dwelling supply. If I am buying a put, you sell short on the underlying asset and you lend out the money. So effectively, you can replicate any option using the underlying asset and borrow on that. So let's talk about this replicating portfolio. And the easiest way to see this is actually by using what's called a binomial model. A binomial model comes with limits, which is at any point in time, your price can go to only one or two points. Okay. So let's take a stock. It's trading at $50 right now. In the next time period, it can either go to 70 or 35. At T equal to one, if it goes to 70, the next time period, it can go to either 100 or 50. If it goes to 35, it can jump to 50 or 25. So at the end of two periods, this stock can be at 100, 50, or 25. Let's suppose I come to you with a call option today with a strike price of 40. So you don't know what's going to happen. All you know is the price today is 50. I come with, this, with a call option with a strike price of 40. Let's, let's look at what the cash flows on this call will be at the very end. No, because that's the only note where you know exactly. So this is a call option that expires at T equal to 2. So your call option, you get the right to buy the stock at 40. Right? If the stock goes to 100, are you going to exercise your right? I hope so. Yes. <laughs> and then you keep the $60 difference. So your cash flow is going to be 60. If it goes to 50, again, you're going to exercise the right. You're going to keep that. If it goes to 25, you're going to take the option. You're going to put it in the trash can and say, I wish I hadn't done that. But you're not Professor. Going to get, so you're going to get zero. Now, of course, Professor. the paid is still there. But let's look at this with gross cash flows. So your cash flows will be 60, 10, and 0 at the end. This is what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to create a combination of borrowing and buying the underlying stock that will be exactly the same cash flows as the call. So let's start at equal to 1. Stock price at 70. I want to buy certain, so let's call it a delta, so call it D shares of stock. And I'm going to borrow B dots. I know there are two unknowns in this. And what do I want that combination to do? I want it to create a cash flow of 60 if the stock goes to 100. So whatever I bought, buy at, at the stock price of 70, and uh, whatever I borrow, the net cash flow has to be 60 if the stock price goes to 100. If the stock price goes to, to 50, I want 50 times D minus 1.11 times B, with 11% of the interest rate, to be 10. So essentially what I've done is I've taken D and B, there are unknowns I know for the moment. I'm giving you the interest rate and said, I want those to be set in a way that I get exactly the same cash flow. I know this is throwing you back way back in time, but remember you've got two equations and two unknowns. You work long enough and hard enough, there should be no unknowns. So you just solve for this. So basically what I'm doing is solving for D and B, and I get D equal to 1 and B equal to 36. So what does that even mean? If the stock price goes to 7, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out and borrow $36.04 and buy one share of stock. That position will have exactly the same cash flow. If the stock goes to 100, that position is going to be 160. If the stock goes to 50, the position is going to be 110. So I've created a replicating portfolio, at least for the moment, with the stock is 70. It's going to be composed of borrowing $36 and buying one share of stock. If the stock goes to 35, we'll repeat the process. 50 times D minus 1.11 times B has to be equal to 10. 25 times D minus 1.11 B is equal to zero. I solve for D and B, and here's what I get. I borrow $9.01, and I buy 0.4 shares of stock. Don't even ask me how you buy 0.4, but assume you can. I get exactly the same cash flows as the call. I've replicated the call at least a T equal to one. They're different portfolios, depending on whether the stock goes to 70 or 35. But I've created a combination of borrowing and the underlying stock that is the same cash flows as the call. Now, of course, I can ask uh, if you work out what it costs you to do this. It basically, in, in, at, at it, you know, one dollar of stock is going to cost me seventy dollars. I borrowed thirty-six dollars and four cents. I have to come up with thirty-three dollars and ninety-six cents. The stock goes to seventy, and I have to come up with four dollars and ninety-nine cents. The stock goes to. In other words, I'm telling you what the value of the call has to be at those points in time to give you exactly the same cash flows as the replicating portfolio. Now let's go back to zero. 
you can already see why with the binomial model you've got to start with the very end of the tree and work backwards. Because the very end of the tree is the only time you know exactly what your cash flows are. So you work one period back. In this case, I've got my T1 values. I go to T equal to zero. I repeat the process. I want to buy shares now. And I want the, the value of my shares to be worth 33.96 the stock goes to 70 and 4.99 the stock goes to 35. So that's 70 times D minus 1.11 is 33.96. 35 times D minus 1.11B is going to 4.99. I solve for D and B. And if I borrow $21.61 today and buy 0.8278 shares of stock today, I get a portfolio that not only is a replicating portfolio today, but it's going to cover all of my needs for the rest of the, of, of the trip, which is stock goes to 70, I'm fully covered. The stock goes to 35, I'm fully covered. I've essentially created a replicating portfolio. The value of the call that I get from that is $19.42. Replicating portfolios, that's what I've computed, arbitrage. I'm assuming that they have the same cash flow that the value you have the same. The binomial model was not the first model. Black-Scholes model came up. The binomial model was developed partly because people had, I mean, I think teachers were trying to teach the Black-Scholes had you know, a really difficult time explaining where in the Black-Scholes you were doing the replication. There's a trust test. There's replication going on because of it. I don't see it. So I think in the 1970s, Mark Rubenstein, who was teaching at UC Berkeley then, came up with this way of saying, this is what replication looks like if you had a binomial model. But the binomial model comes with its own limits, right? At any point, you can have only two points that, it, that your stock can go to. So for, for this model to even have the slightest chance of working, you need to make time really short. Second, one minute. So think of drawing a binomial tree with one minute time intervals for a three month option. It's already making me dizzy just thinking about that tree, right? First, you have to get a really sharp pencil, a really big paper, and start drawing tiny little branches. So you have that kind of patience. And you fill in every single branch. So you're now done, right? You've got this immense binomial tree. How many, set, how many minutes are there in, in three months? I have no idea. I have no idea. But it's a lot of minutes. But you put them on there. Take a look at that paper and then Shift it sideways. So basically, you draw this uh, binomial tree. You see, what does it get? It, give, it looks like a triangle, right? Smooth out the outside of the triangle. What does it look like? What, what statistical distribution does it look like? You've got an order distribution. You take the binomial model, and as you make time really short, in this case, a minute, second, you keep price changes continuous. Basically, that means the price has to move in tiny little increments. The binomial distribution converges on the normal distribution. So what you end up with is a normal distribution without all of the work of having to specify those individual price numbers for thousands and thousands of branches. But there is a chance that you could be wrong, right? Can prices move by large amounts in short periods? jump all the time. The Black-Scholes model does not allow for discontinuous price movements. It's one of the limitations of the model. It's built on this premise of things move gradually. The way you get from $30 to $50 in the Black-Scholes world, you get $30, 30 or 1, 30 or 2, 30 or 3. You don't jump from 30 to 50 because otherwise normal distribution does not work. So it's nice to have the normal distribution. It's convenient, but it comes at that point. So if you look at the Black-Scholes model, the Black-Scholes model is a limiting case of the binomial model if you assume that as price change or time becomes short, the price changes become continuous. So the original Black-Scholes model in 1971, it took Fisher, Black, and Martin Scholes almost a, two years to actually finish the model. We talk about what, what crimped it. Of course, they won the Nobel Prize 30 years, 20 plus years later. Or and in the original Black-Scholes model, there were five inputs that drove the value of, the, of an option. The stock price, S, the strike price, K, T would be the length of life of the option, 
Or is the risk constraint? For whatever reason, Microsoft often seems to be changing my Mac sigmas to question mark, but that's a sigma, the variance. So it's S A T R N, the variance. But weren't there six variables? There seems to be a missing variable. What, what is the sixth variable that I listed out just a few minutes ago, driving on an auction? The value of the asset, the variance in the value, the life of the auction, the evidence. Dividends. There are no dividends anymore. You want to know the honest reason why? Because dividends were so messy to build in mathematically, and that finally Black and Scholes threw up their hands and said, you know what, we're going to assume away dividends. The original Black Scholes was designed to value what I call dividend protected options. They're saying, how would a dividend protected option work? Remember, I said if you have an option, one of the things you worry about is the stock price drops when the dividend is paid. In a dividend protected option, the strike price also is low like, to reflect it. Are there any dividend protected options in the world? None that I know of. But it made their solution much simpler, so they assumed away dividends. Yes, in Brazil there are different. So dividend protected options, so, but maybe the original Black Scholes works better on those options, would be an interesting test. But much of the work can't get dividend protection. So keep that in mind when I show you the Black Scholes model. And remember, all the question marks are sigmas, so don't put in question marks in your final exams. So. Professor? So this is the original Black Scholes Professor? Model. Yes, am I not sharing we're the not, slides we're, with you? We're not, we're, not hearing, we're not hearing you very well or seeing the slides online. Let's see. Let me try that again. Can you see the slides now? Yes, we see Black Scholes model. I'll try and uh, my my. I, I, the reason you might not be hearing me is my voice is not that great, but uh, maybe the mic will help. So the original Black Scholes, and you've all seen this in some version or another in a different class. Here's what drives the value of call option: S, which is the value of the stock today, times N D one. We'll talk about what that is because it's a it's a cumulative you know, area under the normal distribution minus K, which is the strike price, E minus RT. Notice how the Black Scholes makes you use all those buttons on your calculator if you never touched them. Like natural laws, like exponentials. What's E minus RT? What does it go? What is E? It's just an expert. He said, why don't they just use 1 plus r raised to the power t, which is what we do when we do present value, because we're working in continuous time, that 1 plus r raised to the power t, which is what we do for traditional present value. Income. So e minus r t is just a present value factor. Why? Because you don't need to pay the strike price until 2 or 3 or whenever the auction comes to you. So the current stock price times n of, n of d1 minus the present value of the strike price times n of d1. He said, what's D1 and D2? D1 and D2 are a function of all of those variables we talked about, S, K, R, T, and That's what took them two years to get to all of those, is to get that D1 and D2. But they built in the effect of all of the variables, at least this is all of driving the option. Now, as you look at this, you're saying, where's the replication? Where's the arbitrage? I think when people use the black shows, they're so busy getting an output that they don't stop and look at what Black Scholes is actually telling you. Embedded in the Black Scholes is the replicated proposal. To replicate this call, here's what you need to do. You need to go out and borrow KE minus, R, KE minus RT times ND2. That's your borrowing. And buy ND1 shares of stock. The ND1 shares is called the option delta. Option traders, as you know, are very fond of the Greek alphabet. Delta, gamma, theta. Everything in the option lingo is built around this replicating proposal. For instance, if the stock price changes, will the option delta change? Yeah. That's called the option, the option gamma. What if the standard deviation changes? Well, of course, the replicating proposal is 
called the option vega. Everything that option traders are talking about is something to do with the replicating because it's at the heart of option price. In fact, it's the heart of how you hedge options. Right? If I have a big option position I ask you to hedge it, you have to create the replicating portfolio on the other side and hope you did it right because if you didn't do it right, it's going to blow up in my face. The Black-Scholes model gives you a measure of what that replicating portfolio would then your final question is, let's say I've got the D1 and D2, and what exactly is this N of D1 and N of D2? If you're taking a statistics class, there's usually a normal distribution at the end of your statistics book or textbook. That distribution gives you the height of the distribution at different points in the distribution. N of D1 is the area under the distribution. It's a standardized normal distribution. What does that mean? The lowest value n of d can take is 0, and the highest value it can take is 1. 0 to 1. You know what the intuitive way to think of n of d1 and n of d2 is? It's a probability. So we go back to the previous page, say by n of d1, that's it's the number of shares, but it's also a rough estimate of the probability. And in this case, the n of d2 turns out to be a better, better estimate that your option will actually end up in the money. So if you have a D part of the money option, you should expect both N of D1 and N of D2 to be, to be low numbers, you know, between 0 and 1. And the closer your option becomes becoming a sure thing, the N of D1 and N of D2 are going to drift up towards 1. So rather than think of them as statistical artifacts you're plugging in, think of them as probabilities that your option will be in the money or out of the money. So that's the lead-in, and in case you're wondering about dividends, because we have to deal with dividends in many real options, there's a version of the black shows that exists where you, would, where you can adjust the dividends. And in this model, here's all you do. You have to make an assumption that the dividend yield stays constant over the life of the option. That's the easiest way to do it. So let's say your dividend yield is 2%, and your risk-free rate is 4%. The modifications are pretty intuitive. What happens to D1 and D2 will reflect the fact that I now have dividends that I collect. Remember the replicating portfolio? I bought the underlying stock and I borrowed money. I'm now collecting dividends on the stock and using it to pay some of the interest that I owe. It reduces my carrying cost of the option. And by doing so, it does affect the value of my option. So actually, the version of Black Scholes we will be using more in the context of adding real options is this one where the dividend yield is related to the option price in one. So let's summarize. When you look at an option, you're looking at, is there an option? Is there, va is there value to the option? And finally, you're asking, can I use an option pricing model? Option pricing models come with a whole architecture of assumptions. But if you can get them going, they're actually among the most precise models you will run into because they leave, if you keep the underlying asset as your base, you're valuing everything against that underlying asset. You don't have to know the revenue growth, the margins, none of that stuff. That affects the value of the underlying asset. The option derives its value from the underlying asset. So if you look at, there's one small catch if you use the Black-Scholes model. The Black-Scholes model is designed to value what are called European options. It's an unfortunate choice of term because it's there's something to do with geography. There's nothing, right? European options can be exercised only at expiration. But real options get exercised. Early. With listed options, you can see why people use the black shorts. 97% of listed options get held to mature. Why? Because you always make more money by selling to somebody else in the market rather than holding on. We have talked about this in the context of employee options as well. In the case of real options, you know, I talk about a patent as an option. What does exercise that mean? You're converting the patent into a commercial product. Do you want to do that? I would think so. That's the end game of success, right? So with a patent, you want to develop well before the end of the 18th year, whenever your patent runs out. Maybe in the third year, the fifth year, early exercise. You have undeveloped all reserves as an option. You want to develop the reserves? I would think so, well before the end date, where you can't develop them anymore. Real options, almost by definition, will get exercised early. And one of the pushbacks you will get when you use Black Scholes or any, you know, Black Scholes models to value real options is, how come you're using a European option pricing model to value one of clearly American options? Technically, they're right. 
But if you wanted to decide to go with a binomial option pricing model, which can't deal with early exercise, what do I need to do? I need to draw oil prices on a minute-by-minute -minute basis for the next 10 years, not even next three months, because the reserve might last 10 years. I can't do that. I'd much rather get an estimate of value from a Black-Scholes model, and remember, it's going to be a conservative estimate, because the European option is the low end of the value of the your capacity to exercise earlier will only make the option more valuable. It's better to get an estimate that doesn't require so much work that you give up on doing it than to go for an estimate that's going to be so much out of your reach that you can't use it. Now, just as, a, as an aside, you know, often people bring out option pricing, they're bringing out the big ammunition, right? Because option pricing intimidates people, it scares them. And one of my suggestions when somebody calls me and says, can I use an option pricing model to present to managers, you know, what the payoffs here are to a pharmaceutical company? I said, have you tried a decision tree first? It's a much more low-tech way of bringing in these choices you have at different stages. You've seen decision trees there. We have a drug you're developing. You can look at test one, you know, stage one, stage two, stage three, the probability of success. And this is an example as a decision tree. Well, should I test? So if I succeed, what happens at each stage, you're drawing all of the problem out, possible outcomes. And here you can actually have more than, more than unlike a binomial, you have only two choices. You can have four branches, three branches. The difference here is you have to attach probabilities to the branches. If you're willing to draw a full decision, and it's work, I, I know it's, you know, it, take, it takes tremendous amounts of information, and attached properties, you can get an expected value from a decision tree that matches the value you'd have got from using an option pricing model. But it's much more intuitive. It's probabilistic rather than say, trust me on replicating portfolios and arbitrage, which might be completely foreign concepts to manage the pharmaceutical company. So try something low tech for if you can if you can convince people with a decision tree on what the payoffs here are of thinking about the choices. You don't need to bring the option price argument into the mix. Any questions about the mechanics of option pricing? Yes? Maybe this is going uh, to be further on, but the expected value that comes out of a decision tree in a business, if the expected value is 50, it's 50, but the, the outcomes are either 100 or 0, whilst you could value it at 50, reality, the downside is so, so significant to your business operations, in a way I guess you're not diversified across lots of different decisions. Is it, how, how does that? That's why it's not quite an expected value. Once you get past that very, I use that very simple decision yeah. to kind of start the process. An option pricing model is actually a risk, because remember the underlying asset is already risk adjusted for value, right? So if I have you know, computer present value cash flows from developing the drug, a patent into a drug, I bring in my worries into a cost of capital in computing the present value. So now I have the present value. It's lower than what I think it will cost me to develop the drug. It's a negative net present value. But that negative net present value is already risk adjusted. All the option pricing is trying to do is, what if in the future the present value of my risk adjusted cash flows exceeds my initial investment? So the risk is already factored into the option pricing, but what it's also bringing in is all of the different outcomes that can happen with the present value. And that's why it uncertainly matters. Because if you're certain about the present value today, and it's less than the initial investment, there is no option there. You're going to turn the project down and say, I'm done. It's because you're uncertain about how this project will evolve in the future that you add that premium on to that. So, let's review three basic tests whenever you run into somebody using an option and you is there an option embedded in the ad? Draw the payoff diagram and make sure there's an option. Second, is there exclusivity? If there is, there's value to the option. If there isn't, be very careful. And third, can I use an option pricing model to value this option? And for that, you need replication or arbitrage. Can I trade the underlying asset? Can I trade the option? The option itself needs to be traded as well. I'm not sure how you trade a patent. Maybe you can sell it to another company, but it's not as if there's a market for options. But every real option, I'm going to end with this question because it's going to tell you how much we're stretching. What is actually a very powerful technology to value financial assets into value real assets? So let's start with options and projects and investments. 
in a traditional way, we've been taught to look at projects as cash flows, compared to the initial investment, come up with an NPV, if it's negative, it's a bad project, if it's positive, it's a good project. But as I said, there are three things we know when we do this. First is that a project that's a bad project today could become a good project tomorrow, or a year from now, three years from now. So the rights to a bad project can actually be bad. It sounds contradictory, but the rights to a bad product, to non-viable technology, can be bad. Second, I'm going to talk about the option to delay, which is you take a bad investment, knowing it's a bad investment, going into open eyes. But you think it will open the doors to much bigger potential opportunities in the future with potentially higher value. The classic example is companies that went into China, when China first opened up, knowing they would lose money early on, but saying, it's a big market. And if that initial investment pays off, think of how much money you can make. That's the option to expect. And third is the option to ban, which is on really long-term investments, being able to walk away from your investment. It's a great deal of um, you know, homage being paid to being flexible as a company now, especially in the aftermath of COVID, and when, you know, the companies that are flexible have an advantage. And I think they do. The option to abandon actually is a measure of how much flexibility have you built into your model, being able to walk away from the risks. Right? A lot of the technology disruptors that have come up in the last decade have built themselves on being more flexible than their status quo. This gives you a way of value how much that option is worth. And these options all have value and they could potentially take an investment that has a negative net present value and make it into an investment that you would take anyway because of these options that come So let's start with the option to delay. For the option to delay argument to even get started, you have to have an exclusive right to do something, an exclusive right to take a project. So let's say you have an exclusive right. That exclusive right today, if you developed it, might have a negative net present value. The project can change over time, right? The technology can change, the market can change, the net present value can go from being negative to positive. So as I said, every real option I'm going to talk about, I'm going to introduce with a payoff diagram. So here's what the payoff diagram looks like for the option. You have the exclusive rights to take the project. What does exercise mean? You will have to make the investment to take the project. That becomes a strike price. You, you get to decide. It's a, it's a right, not an obligation. You can choose to make the investment. Under what conditions will we make the investment if the present value of the expected cash flows exceeds that initial investment? So right now you have the exclusive right. It's not viable right now. The, net, the present value of cash flows is less than the initial investment. But you have three, four, five, ten years of this exclusive right. If the present value of cash flows rises enough, you will take the investment and claim the difference. So the option to delay comes from the fact that the net present value of the loan negative now could become positive. I'm going to use this the option to delay setup to look at two aspects of investing. One is the value of a patent, which I think can be framed very simply as an option to delay. And the other is the value of undeveloped resources, the so oil, oil, gold, whatever you have, and value gain as an option. So let's start with valuing a patent. What do you get with a patent? You get the exclusive right. So you checked off the exclusive reward, right? Unless you're in a country where your patent is not protected by, by legal authorities, by the courts, you have an exclusive right. For how long? Again, it varies across countries. It could be 18 years, 20 years. But let's say you have the exclusive right for the next 18 years. To do what? To develop the patent if you choose to. That's the right. What will happen if you choose to develop the patent? You have to invest something to get the patent into a commercial product. Let's call what you invest art, not being particularly creative. So that's what it will cost you to develop the patent. Billion dollars, two billion, whatever it is. And let's say the present value of the cash flows you will get if you develop the patent today, because that's all you can tell me. You can't tell me what's in the future, is B. So I is what you need to invest to develop the patent. B is the present value of the expected cash flows from developing the patent. If this B is greater than I, you will develop the patent. It's an the money option. If B is less than I, what will you do? And wait, hope that something good will happen. Doesn't it look a lot like a call option payoff? S minus K replaces B minus I. In fact, if you drew this as a, as a payoff diagram, the cost of converting the patent into a product becomes the equivalent of the strike price. The present value of the cash flows 
from the drug or whatever else that, you can, that comes out of the patent will become the equivalent of the stock price. The life of the patent becomes the life of the option. What's the variance? What am I looking at? What's my underlying asset? The drug or product that comes out of the patent, right? Today I have an expected set of cash flows and a present value. Am I certain about them? Not in the least. The uncertainty in those cash flows, the variance in those cash in that present value is what I need. You think, where am I going to find that? This is not a traded stock. I'll give you a couple of ways you can perhaps get that number. But that variance is what's driving the value of this option. So if I were to list out the variance, the value of the underlying assets, the present value of the cash flows, and while you're doing this, you know the constant complaint you're going to have is, but if this is a patent, we don't know what the market looks like. I'm too uncertain. And my response is, good. You see why good? Where does the value of an option come from? One of the few cases where being uncertain actually works in your favor. The more uncertain you are, the more you should think about optionality. Of course you're uncertain. You have a new AI project. You have no idea what the market looks like. Of course you're going to be uncertain. Make your best estimates. You get a present value. What do you want? You, you have to do that notwithstanding the uncertainty. Second stop, you're going to say, well, can I estimate how much uncertainty there is? Well, there are, there are two ways. One is the easy and perhaps lazy way, which is to look up the standard deviation of stocks in the AI space and say, market must know something. I'll use that standard deviation. The other is, look what we did Monte Carlo simulations. We got an expected value. We did this with Disney, or, uh, with, uh, with, with um, uh, was it Exxon Mobil, I think, or Royal, Royal Dutch. I got a value per share, and then I got a standard deviation that value. I could do the same thing on a project basis. I could compute the net present value of the project, which is negative right now, but give you a standard deviation of present value. So that'll give you the standard deviation. The exercise price in the option is what it would cost you to actually develop your patent into a commercial product. The life of the option is whenever the option would become the life of the patent. And there's one final ingredient I'm going to put in. If I stop right there, S, K, R, T, and sigma, the value of the option will always be greater than the exercise value. Makes sense, right? If you have a listed option, that's what we do. You know, we sell it, so there's a time period of the option. I need to introduce a variable here that will cause you to exercise. Because as I said, if you sit on every option the very last day of X, uh, to the patent expires, you've in a sense lost the value of the option. So every year you wait after an option becomes viable, you're giving up something. Because right? here's the trade-off. Let's say two years in, the patent becomes viable. You have 17 years left in the patent. Part of you says, let's develop right away. It's a viable option. But somebody says, but let's wait a year. Let's collect more information. Will that be helpful? Absolutely. You get a better product, maybe a better sense of the market, price it better. But there is a price you pay for waiting, right? What do you give up? One year of protection from competition. There's a cost of delay. That cost of delay is what I capture here by saying, look, once you get viable you, and you decide to wait, it's going to cost you one out of the eight, remaining 17 years or 16 years. It's kind of a shortcut. That's basically what you're losing by waiting. What will happen to that cost as I go from 17 years to 16 to 15? The cost to delay is going to rise every year. You see what? 117 is going to become 116, then 115. Which means I'm prodding you constantly once a patent becomes promising. Are you developing now? Are you developing now? Because you keep putting it off too long, you're giving up too much of that protection. That is the whole point of getting the patent in the first place. So I'm going to try this on an actual drug. And one of the reasons I was able to do this was actually able to get my hands on an actual cash flow analysis that Biogen had done on a drug called Avenix. It's now in the market now, but it, this was in the late 90s. They developed the drug. It's for MS, a promising drug, supposedly a blockbuster drug. And Avenix had projected cash flows on the drug and got a present value. 3.4%. They had just you know, filed the patent. They had 17 years of protection. They are the only ones who could develop out of this. They hadn't developed it yet. So what I'm going to try to do is assess whether they should develop Avenix right away, whether they should wait, whether there's a value to buy. 
So let's compute the S. S is the present value of the cash flows. Have any of you seen um, how pharmaceutical companies compute cash flows in a drug? It's actually a scary exercise because here's how it will go. Start with the percentage of the population that has MS. Then you look at what percentage of those people actually go to a doctor. It's not 100%. Then the percent that go to a doctor, they look at the percentage that actually get the right diagnosis, and it's not 100%. And among the people who get the right diagnosis, you look at the percentage you can actually afford the treatment, it's not 100%. So you start off with 3 million people with MS, by the time you do these cuts, you're down to 1.3 million. And then you estimate the price and expect the cash flows, and that's what they used to come up with 3.4. At the time that I did this analysis, Biogen has never developed a drug on their own. There are two other drugs they developed, but they sold them off to other pharma companies. It's basically an R&D operation. But this drug they wanted to develop on their own. And they estimated that it would cost them about $2.9 billion to set up the infrastructure to actually develop and sell the drug, 2.875. So let's, let me pause right there. 2.875 billion is what it would cost them to set up the infrastructure. The present value of cash flows in developing the drug is 3,422 million. You take the difference between those two numbers, you get 547 million. What is that? That's just my net present value. If I did traditional capital budgeting, that's where I'd stop. The net present value of this project is 547 million. I want you to remember that. That's your intrinsic value for the project, right? 547 million. But remember, they had the right to develop the drug any time over the next 17 years. Waiting can provide the benefits. Maybe they can fine tune the drug to reduce side effects. So let's look at the option idea, which is you have 17 years of life left, so you can you have some time as your ally. Riskless rate was 6.7%. This is a very risky business. I, I, you know, I tried a Monte Carlo simulation, but the in the late 90s, and have the architecture, there's no crystal ball. Here. Today I might try a full fledged simulation. In, in the late 90s, I basically took the standard deviation of biotech companies and assumed that that's all driven by the uncertainty about biotech products, and used that as my standard deviation. Tremendous amount of uncertainty about the future, 0.224. And each year, this is a, is this a viable drug already? Yeah, S is greater than K, 3.422 billion is greater than 2.875 billion. If I choose to wait, what do I lose? I lose one out of those 17 years of protection that I have. Cost to delay of 5.8 billion. Plug in D1, D2, N of D1, N of D2. Remember I said N of D2 gives you a rough estimate of the probability that this drug will be developed. File it away, because you know, it looks at least in this model, that there's a substantial amount of uncertainty in the future. You plug the numbers in. The value that I get for the call, if I plug in into a black show, I accept it's, a, you know, it's not a perfect model, it's a European option, it's all that put, put in place. The value that I get for the option is 907 million. So your biogen, I have two numbers here. 547 million, which is the net present value, which is what you get if you do what? You develop the drug. 907 million, which is the value of this drug <coughs> as an option. If I'm an MS patient, this is very bad news for me. You know why? Because based on those two numbers, what am I asking you to do? Not develop the drug. Waiting. You will give up something for 170, but there's enough benefit from waiting that you get the upside. In fact, it, you know, I, I actually plotted out when they would actually develop the drug if these numbers stay what they were. So basically, I did this with 10, so reducing it. They would not develop the drug to almost year nine because the benefits of waiting is so low. Well. But, but, there, but there's one final part of the story that, that I think brings us back to life. Biogen actually almost instantaneously what am I missing in my cost of delay? Because the cost of delay is what's causing this waiting, right, basically. What am I missing in my cost of delay that's leading me to overestimate the option? Yeah. So there, there aren't any other solutions to that's score exactly right. right. If I am the only pharma company in place, this is exactly what I do. 
I'll wait as long as I can because why would I want to cannibalize what's already out there? GlaxoSmithKline, you have the leading ulcer drug in the market. You come up with a better ulcer drug. You're, you're, nobody else is coming up with ulcer drugs. Guess what you do? You wait until it's the right time and then kick it in. In this case, what was happening was the two other, I think it's Merck and Upjohn, that had their own MS drugs working their way through the pipeline. And Biotech said, we can't wait. Because what does it take to cost a delay? It's from 117. They thought they had a four year lead on the competition. You know what that makes a cost of delay? One over four, which is 25%. You put in a 25% cost of delay, the option pricing value drops to 350 million, which is less than the five, four, you know, 547 million. I think that we overplay the optionality in the pharmaceutical business if there's a lot of competition. Once in a while, if you have a blockbuster drug with no competition on the horizon, and once in a while kind of, there, there is that, that happens, then you have this worry of how long will the pharmaceutical company wait? Because there is a benefit to waiting and you know, collecting more information, making sure the side effects are right. But it comes at the cost of people with that disease who like that drug right now. So the optionality here is reflected in that premium. So you can value Avenix as an option. But let yeah, go ahead. So wouldn't that assumption that either the only care or not the only care be embedded in the cash flows that you estimate? It would get low, but it, it's on top of it. So it will affect both your expected cash flows and it will. So you might have pricing power for the next five years, but this is over and above that, right? It's how quickly do we need to jump on to start making money before somebody else comes in and makes those margins even lower. So I think that even if you build it into your margins, it's not going to affect the option. So it might affect the present value, the S, the model, but it won't affect the conclusion, which is you will develop almost much more quickly when there's competition in the horizon than when there is. There is a benefit to having a comparative pharmaceutical business where multiple companies are working on solutions or, or drugs, as opposed to a monopoly pharmaceutical company, which is the only game in town. And this is one of the benefits is you will get drugs come out quicker because no company can sit on a solution for too long. It's too much to lose. So let's suppose you're not interested in valuing a single drug, you're valuing a company. And it happens to have a very valuable patent. You're saying, how do I make this a company? Because you, you can't go out and buy shares in a drug, right? You've got to buy shares in a company. Let's say you're interested in, uh, in Biogen. You like Avalanx. You're saying, but I want to value Biogen as a company. Well, the way, one way to do it is in a discounted cash flow model. If I told you Biogen is Avalanx and it's this great blockbuster drug, that's what we went through. How do you reflect that in the DCF model? What are the inputs and output you put into it? You showed us higher revenue growth because they're going to enter the MS market, higher margins, you come up with higher expected cash flows, you come up with the right efficient. That's That option is always open. That's the option that we do in intrinsic valuation is we use the argument that a company has a great pack of patents to justify higher growth rates and improving margins. But there's another approach that might work, especially if you have small pharmaceutical companies with a single big patent driving the value. And there are quite a few of those, where one patent is at the core of the company. Right? You can value the company in three pieces. First, you value the existing products that the company has. It's a traditional discounted cash flow valuation. No growth, just take the existing products, value them as products. Second stop, you value the options, just like I did, evidence, you value the options. And the third step, and this is the trickiest, you take the existing R&D and you ask, how much value will my existing R&D create or destroy over time? You already see why, right? We talked about how R&D can be value creating, value destroying. So you can actually value the company in three pieces. Existing products, patents, and continuing R&D. Let's try that for Biogen. At the time that, you know, that Biogen came out with Avenix, they had two drugs outstanding. You know, one was for, you know, and, uh, and, and both were licensed out to other pharmaceutical companies. They were collectively generating about 50 million in after-tax cash flows on these, on guaranteed licenses, 50 million every year for the next five years. If that's all you have, is that set of cash flows, you can value them, right? You'd have to discount the 50 million back to today. At the right discount. So what's the discount rate I should use 
on these expected cash flows. These are Biogen's expected cash flows, but who's paying them? Merck or Upjohn or whoever's getting the drug, right? Who's, who's bought the, the rights to the drug from you? What do they guarantee you? They guaranteed you that they will pay you 50 million a year. So what are you worried about? The fall. The discount rate here has to reflect the risk in the cash flows. The risk in the cash flows comes from the fact that the guarantor might default. So to discount these cash flows, I use the pre-tax cost of debt of the guaranteeing companies. What I'm trying to say is don't be so quick to jump on cost of capital as a discount rate every single time. In fact, let me re reframe this. What if Biogen had, get, had the same two drugs, but they sold them to Medicare, and the U.S. government had guaranteed them 50 million a year for the next 12 years. What would I have done to people? I just used the risk to make. So I think it's so easy we jump on to a cost of capital for a company. But think about the risk in these cash flows. The present value of the cash flows was 397.13. So I've got a value of Avenex as an option. I've got the value of the existing drugs they have at the present value of cash flows. I turn to the R&D, and I'll tell you, I have to make up stuff here to get some numbers to work. Why? Because who knows what the quality of R&D in a company is. All you have is a young company that's had some success. But I mean, my, I, I'm going to try my best. I took the R&D expenses from the most recent year, which are 100 million, and assumed they would continue to grow 20% a year for the next 10 years. So big R&D spending for the next 10 years. That's going to be my cash out. Why am I doing this? Because I hope to generate new drugs, new patents in the future. I'm going to assume that Biogen, which has a history of three successes already, can continue to generate those successes. We'll ask a what if question that. And they can ge generate a dollar twenty-five in value for every dollar that they invest. So if they invest hundred million R&D, they create on an expected basis hundred and twenty-five million. That, that's built on an earning return on capital about 3 to 4 percent above your cost of capital. So dollar twenty-five each year. And I'm going to allow for the fact that this is much riskier than everything else about Biogen. And here I'm going to use a cost of capital of Biogen as a company saying, this is the risky part of Biogen. See, so the numbers were cut. There's my expense in R&D, 120 million next year, 100 million growing at 20 percent. Multiplied by a dollar twenty-five gives me the value of those. It's an expected value. I have no idea whether it'll actually happen. That difference of thirty million becomes my excess value created year one. I discount it back at fifteen percent, and I do this every year. You take the sum of those values. The value that I get from continuing R and D is three hundred million million dollars. And as I told you, the one twenty-five in value for every dollar you spend in R and D comes from assuming you can earn about three percent more than the cost. Of if you earn exactly your cost of capital, what's that number going to be? One. It's going to be one, so basically, and the value of the R&D is going to go to zero. And if the return of capital is 3% below the cost of capital, the continuing R&D is actually going to have a negative value. It's going to reduce the value of the company. So this becomes the vehicle that you use to tell me whether you think this company has an R&D department worth adding value for because it's the history of the difference. So my final valuation of Biogen, I took the, the, the drugs they'd already licensed out, 397 million. I added the value of Avenex as an option, added the value of the continuing R&D. value that I get is 1.62 billion. That's like the present value of the free cash flow of the firm is kind of back at the cost of capital. So it's a different way of getting to that DCF bottom line, but I've done it in pieces. You. They had no debt, the cash was close to zero, I divided by the number of shares, got a value per share of 45 cents. I did this for Biogen because at the time that I did it, it was a small company, got the bulk of its value essentially from the Avenix. Right. I would never try this at a Merck or a Pfizer. Think of what? If I tried this at a Pfizer, how many patents does Pfizer have? Oh, hundreds, right? I would sit there doing this on each one. And the payoff to doing it is going to be far smaller because once you create a portfolio of options, the benefits of looking at individual option stuff, and that's where traditional DCF models allow you to say, I have a portfolio of options, I'm going to use a 3% higher growth rate in revenues, and move on. It's not precise, but it's perhaps a more pragmatic solution if you have a bigger pharma company. But if you have a single patent pharma company, uh, or 
of a former company's value to Walter and single patent. This approach can give you a sense of what the value that fact is. And at least a couple of people in this class are valuing very young pharma companies, often with one patent, can at least try the option pricing one. It seems like a lot of the value in the option is attached to the variance that you think. Exactly. And that which, which actually has some very interesting implications. If you think of R&D as the cost you're paying to acquire options, because that's what this now becomes, right? What does it tell you about where pharmaceutical companies should direct their R&D? Most risky, the most uncertain parts of healthcare because that's where the payoff to R&D is going to be great. So it does mean that there'll be a redirecting of R&D. So you're saying, why is my, my you know, the, I'm getting you know, migraines, and why isn't somebody coming up with a better migraine medication? It might turn out that the migraine medication, the uncertainty in that part of the business is low enough that people don't want to throw in billions of dollars in R&D in there because the payoff is not as high. So in a strange way, gene therapy will beat out migraines every single day in competing for that R&D dollar, not simply because there's higher upside, but because the uncertainty about the future is greater. So in a strange way, the implications of option pricing can also redirect where healthcare spending is going. And it has consequences for all of us in terms of how it pays out in products and services. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I will see you on Wednesday. Reminder again, your business in the first quarter of class, so we'll try not to be late and we'll continue with option pricing.